Travel all over the countryside, Oscar Leyland, Oscar Leyland. Travel all over the countryside, Oscar Leyland, brother. Whatever it is that you want to see, Oscar Leyland, Oscar Leyland. No matter whatever that happens to be, Oscar Leyland, brother. Come on, me in it and join in the fun. Travel all over Australia. Everybody loves wild animals, and this week we've got a very unusual one for you, the beautiful Australian fur seal. It's a wild one that comes in from the ocean to the port of Port Albert here in Victoria. Then we're off to the South Island of New Zealand to take a look at a stone which is found in the bush and later turned into jewellery. The stone is known as greenstone, and the jewellery, New Zealand jade. Then we're going to New South Wales to take a journey by jeep along a four-wheel section of the old Great North Road, which was built between Newcastle and Sydney. It's carved through the mountains by the convict labour, something quite different here in New South Wales. Port Albert is a small fishing village just over 200 kilometres east of Melbourne in Victoria. A quiet, picturesque spot fronting onto the windswept Tasman Sea, not far from the southernmost part of the Australian mainland, Wilson's Promontory an ideal retreat for a pleasant holiday. But it's not a vacation which brings us to Port Albert. Well, we've come to Port Albert because of a letter from Mrs M Carter in Terrigal, New South Wales, who says that, I've heard that in a small fishing town in Victoria, that a wild seal has become friendly enough to be hand-fed. Is this true, or is it really a tamed one? Well, it took us quite a while to track down that it was Port Albert you were referring to, Mrs Carter, but it is in fact a wild seal, and we're going to talk now with the man who's been feeding it, or I really should say them. And Snow Manifold, you're the manager of the um, seafood uh, operation here, aren't you? Yes, well, that's right. And uh, what actually happened now? This was started off just, what, throwing fish out and they came in, or how did it begin? Uh, around about to 11 months ago, the first one appeared, and uh, he just, he was in a very, very damaged condition. He'd been attacked by a shark. And uh, stayed around the wharf area for some time. We fed him. Um, didn't go away. It uh, stayed around for some months, as a matter of fact, and... Uh, Eventually it goes away now and comes back every couple of weeks. And, and then this we've second one's a smaller one, isn't it? He's, a, he's about half the size of the original one, and uh, he uh, appeared on site, and uh, he just doesn't go away at all. He's, he's horribly spoiled. He just won't go away. Yeah, and what do you do? You just feed him uh, scraps or something, or do you feed him whatever you... Unfortunately, so far, he doesn't like scraps. He's feeding on good quality fish, oh. which is not very good for us, but, I mean, well, he's a pet anyway. Yeah, so you really regard him as a, as a bit of a pet now? He is now, yes. He's... Uh, He's certainly not uh, a tamed one that somebody's let go or anything like that. He's quite definitely a wild seal. Mm. Well, that might answer Mrs Carter's question mm. about it being uh, a tame one or not, but uh, tell me something, do they uh, stay around all the time or do they sometimes sort of go off to sea? Eventually he will go, or both of them will go to sea, um, uh, out to a nearby rock, namely White Rock, uh, where there is a seal colony, and I would imagine that they'll eventually both go back there for breeding. Yeah, I noticed that one of them's got a tag on, or the little one, it's the only one I've seen, it's got mm -hmm. a tag on it. Um, have you been able to get the number off that and identify it? Uh, we've got the number off the tag, uh, Mel, and uh, according to the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, it was a seal which was tagged at Seal Rocks, Phillip Island, in Western Port Bay, um, sometime between one and two years ago. So he'd be one to two years old? He'd be one to two years old. That's right. The local fishermen bring their catches to Snow, who buys as a wholesaler. His modern factory includes machinery which automatically fillets the fish. But every day, Snow saves a handful of the freshest catch, or Selena, the friendly seal. The seal usually sleeps on the beams of the wharf and comes splashing for a handout as soon as Snow slaps the water. Snow reckons it's like a dog and loves a game. 
The dog's gonna be in the egg too. Snow's wife, Irene, and his children also love the friendly seal and make the trip down to the wharf every morning before school. The seal is so friendly, it's hard to believe that it really is a wild creature from the sea. Even the fishermen, who scorned the seal at first, reckoning it would be a nuisance, have developed a soft spot for their unique interloper. It's easy to see how Snow has become attached to his friendly seal. But if things keep going the way they are, Snow says the seal will eat him out of business. And so far he won't eat scraps. The other seal is much larger and visits the fishing port at irregular intervals. As they get older, Snow thinks they will return to the sea to breed and he will probably never see them again. A heartwarming relationship between man and nature, which we found out about thanks to Mrs Carter, who asked the Leyland brothers. Mrs T. Renshaw from Blacktown, New South Wales, writes and says that her daughter returned from New Zealand with a gem she called greenstone, which is supposed to be a type of jade, and asks if we could tell her where it comes from and how the jewellery is made. Well, to find the answers, we've come to Hoka Tika on the west coast of New Zealand, South Island. This small town is where most of the greenstone is turned from raw material into jewellery. And yes, it is indeed jade, considered by most people to be the finest in the world, including China. To learn more, I speak to the factory manager, who prefers to be known simply as Mac. Well, we're inside the Westland Greenstone factory, and we're talking now with Mac. Mac, uh, these look rather huge pieces of, of Greenstone. Where, where do you get it from? Well, the piece you're sitting on is a piece of a boulder that weighed three, about three and a half tonne. We find all this stone uh, in the mountainous country to the east of Hokotika, between two and 4,000 feet above sea level. It's in a small creek up there, and uh, the boulders lie in that creek. Nature did the mining for us millions of years ago and dumped these huge boulders in this particular creek. And how do you um, get these rather large pieces out? The only method of getting it down from the mountainous country where we find it is by helicopter. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, uh, we have to cut the boulders up in the mountains to not more than a thousand pound weight because that's the limit that the helicopter can carry. We fly it down to the end of the road and then truck it down from there, which is approximately 20 to 25 miles. The first stages of preparing the huge boulders of jade is to slice the incredibly hard stone with a diamond saw. It may take eight hours to cut through some of the large rocks. Carefully avoiding any slight imperfections, a faint design is scratched onto the sliced stone, in this case pendant-sized tikis, reduced copies of the traditional Maori lucky charms. Using diamond dust impregnated grinding wheels, experienced gem cutters grind the shapes according to the pattern. At this stage, the individual pieces are attached to the tip of a stick for easy working, very much like grinding Australian opals. The final stages of polishing are carried out with leather buffer and ferrous oxide paste. Women complete the final assembly of the finished jewellery.
Most of the less expensive jade takes the form of earring droplets and pendants. The more valuable pieces are individually handcrafted, sometimes to customers' own designs. Finished pieces like this fetch big prices, but some objects of New Zealand jade are too valuable for Mac to sell. A set of bookends displaying an uncanny likeness of Satan. And another adorned with an astonishingly accurate map of New Zealand's South Island, the home of Greenstone. Surveyor Finch built this fine sandstone home at about the completion of the Great North Road in 1831. The reason we're here today is that we have a letter from Mr B. Tier for Burigal in New South Wales, who asks, I've heard that the first road between Sydney and the Hunter Valley was built by convict labour well over 100 years ago. I know that much of it is still in use today, but as a lesser important road. I've heard there is a length of road which was abandoned last century. Could you show us this historic section? Well, we can do that for you, Mr Tier. And the old North Road, which is now the one that's in use now, runs through here, and it's bitumen here, but further down the road it turns into gravel, where we head off onto this old section you talk about. In 1825, Surveyor Finch completed the survey for a great North Road to link Sydney with the growing community of the Upper Hunter Valley. The road was to go through Windsor and Wiseman's Ferry, and up over the Judge Dowling Range, and through to Singleton on the Hunter River. We're interested in the abandoned section that contains most of the convict workings. The man who probably knows the road best is Selby Alley. He has come along to explain its hidden highlights, accompanied by his friends Brian and Bob. This bridge is the first piece of convict stonework to be seen coming in from Mount Manning at the northern end of the abandoned 27-mile section. Selby has spent years checking government records and walking along the road to gather scraps of information to compile the most accurate record of its construction and present condition. The noise of thousands of cicadas makes it difficult to hear Selby's explanations. This bridge appears to be built for no real reason, as they're situated on a flat plain section where a flooded river would seem unlikely. The man hours in the construction must have amounted to thousands, and it was built to last. The stonework is still in perfect condition. With no maintenance and 140 years, it says a lot for our convict road builders. These are uh, unused, unused uh, slots in the rock in which wedges were hammered. Those unhappy men then belted them with uh, hammers and in this way split the top layer off the rock. Then if another row were put in down here, they'd have a square block of rock that they'd cut out of the mass. Of course these things here are only just erosion marks and sandstone. These square blocks of rock are in an area Selby called the workshop, a place where the rough split blocks were hewn into shape with picks and hammers and chisels. Before the first white settlers were working these stones here, the Aborigines had worked it for centuries, and some of their markings still remain, hidden deep in the scrub off the road. These are uh, Aboriginal sharpening grooves. Sometimes you'll call them axe grooves because I suppose axes were sharpened more often than anything else, or made. They made their axes in these. The two requisites were an abrasive rock, and they differ in abrasive qualities, and a supply of water for lubricant. And as the axe was ground, of course, the rock was ground away too, leaving these very characteristic uh, shallow, uh, boat-shaped grooves. There are millions of them, I suppose, in the forest around us here. I've seen thousands anyway. Just through here, Rob, I'll be showing you the uh, rock engravings I told you on. 
This vertical rock here, unusually, has on it a large engraved figure. Tell me any idea. I feel that this cannot be anything else than an engraving of one of the Aboriginal's most important animal symbols, their rainbow serpent. You see, it not only is engraved over most of its length, but there are remains of the peck marks which they make in the construction of the, any of their rock engravings. They peck these marks in with a pointed piece of rock all around the outline and then break the uh, intervening walls down and smooth them out and they have the engraved line like this. This is a large one and it's unusual in being put on a horizontal rock, on a vertical rock. Most of it on the flat horizontal rock. One's about 13 feet long. Along the roadside, many rocks are engraved with dates and names of early travellers who used the Great North Road. Also engravings of crosses, possibly where convict road builders met their deaths. When work began on this section of the road, there were as many as 520 convicts toiling in the hot summers and cold winters. Governor Darling described them as the very refuse of the convict population. At night they were chained together to stop escapes, but some of the more desperate men had been sentenced to work in leg irons and chain, in some cases for as long as seven years. The lightest weight for the irons was 13 pounds and 12 ounces. Finding drinking water for the convicts was a problem in the dry hilly country. This is one of the old drinking troughs. Holes cut in the side of the rock, in the rocks at the side of the road, you know, and replenished by soakage and providing drinking water for the road gangs. Tastes all right? That's good water. Soaking out of the hill and cool too. Dragging lay irons up and down these hills would have been murder for those road gangs. But they were forced to work, drilling, blasting and cutting rock, living in primitive camps on daily rations of one pound of fresh or salt beef, one pound of wheat and meal, and half a pound of maize meal. We've just passed the halfway mark on the road. This is the 12 mile marker, which was put in about 147 years ago when the road was completed. This 12 represents 12 miles from Wiseman's Ferry, which is the direction that we're heading in now. This bridge has new decking on it and is kept in good repair for access to the National Park on the eastern side of the road. This pier, it looks as though it's been shaped nearly to withstand a flood, but in fact that, that gully is only a few hundred yards long, it terminates just up there. Nevertheless, it looks very good. As well as bridges built to withstand floods, the road is drained by huge box culverts that run under the road and discharge into the valley below. This road was built to last, but it was only in use for 53 years before a better route was discovered where water and feed for the bullocks that used the road was in plentiful supply. An interesting natural feature on the road is this weathered overhang, popularly called hanging rock. Steps lead up to the seats cut out of rock below a hole in the overhang. Then more steps lead further up to the top and a clearing above where the convicts had a campsite. Selby believes this was the only use for the so-called hanging rock as an easy way up to the camp from the steep roadworks that cut around the mountainside here. goes that this was a hanging rock, a sort of 
impromptu courtroom. Uh, the judge or magistrate sat down below in the seats that you've already seen. The prisoner was up here, <laughs> purely with a rope around his neck suspended from a tree, and when he was pronounced guilty, he was pushed through this hole and uh, hung by the neck till he was dead. Of course, these are fantasies. People don't do that sort of thing. They never did. Uh, we were pretty rough in those early days, but not that rough. So the Hanging Rock is just one of the names that people like to give things like this rather beautiful uh, sandstone overhang. Yes, it is a beautiful sandstone overhang of which there are thousands in this country along both sides of the Great North Road. The last two miles descent to Wiseman's Ferry is the most spectacular on the journey and was also the most difficult to build as there's a winding road mostly cut into sandstone bedrock extended out and buttressed by these massive squared blocks of stone fitted together without mortar to form retaining walls up to 40 feet high and still in perfect condition. After five years of sweat and toil, the Great North Road was completed from Wiseman's Ferry to Maitland in 1830. It was then the most costly and elaborate work performed in the colony up to that time. Today, an important historic relic, a step back into the past when men worked in chains to build a road that is now like a museum of convict days lying hidden in the bush, unprotected by legislation and unknown by most people. We would like to thank Mr. Tier for bringing the Great North Road to our attention and to Selby Alley who hopes this film may encourage people into doing something to help save the abandoned section from the elements. It would be a fitting memorial to all the men who worked and died on this part of the road if this 27 miles of the Great North Road was preserved for future generations to see and was added to the National Park. Travel all over the countryside, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, travel all over the countryside, ask the Leyland brothers. Whatever it is that you want to see, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, no matter whatever that happens to be, ask the Leyland brothers. Come on. Travel all over Australia